Hello again. Today, let's talk about core action value number six, faith. And let's be very clear. When we talk about faith as a value, we are not talking about religion or we're not talking about specific religious belief. Everybody needs faith. Whatever your religious belief or non-belief happens to be, we all need faith. And I actually have a working definition for faith as a value that blends two things, fidelity and trust. Fidelity means being faithful to something beyond just you, in your own self-interest. Being faithful to a spouse, a family, faithful to a cause, to an organization, living with fidelity. And trust means having faith in something beyond your control. Having trust, having faith in other people, having trust, having faith for the future. Um, and I think of faith in terms of the four pillars of faith. You need faith in these four dimensions. One is faith in yourself. Uh, you've probably noticed that a, a key theme through this whole course is helping you have that faith in yourself, helping you stand up to that negative voice in the back of your head, helping you overcome a poor self-image, helping you break through the bars of fear and doubt that may hold you back from becoming your authentic best self. Faith in other people. Remember we talked about empathy and objectivity and being a Diana rap, the word paranoid spelled backwards. You know, having, assuming good faith on the part of other people, having faith in other people unless you're given reason to believe otherwise. Faith in the future. You know, having faith that no matter how dark and, and challenging things may seem right now, it'll all work out somehow. And, and sometimes that faith in the future, that trust in the future, contributes to a self-fulfilling prophecy. And finally, I hope faith in something bigger than the almighty dollar, something, faith in something bigger than just what's in your own self-interest, faith in a, a cause, a purpose, Ho hopefully faith in some higher power, something that's bigger than just what you can see with your, the visible eyes, however you would define that. One more comment about faith before we talk about the, the cornerstones, and that's this. Faith, almost by definition, faith is what begins at the point where certainty ends. You don't need faith when you're in total control and absolutely certain about what needs to be done and what, what uh, the outcomes are. Faith is something you need to have, and you need more faith the more uncertain, the more challenging it is. And we live in uncertain, challenging, and turbulent times now, and faith becomes so much more important, faith as a value. So let's look at the cornerstones. And it begins with cornerstone number one, gratitude. Having an attitude of gratitude, being grateful for what you've been blessed with. You know, Sunday's promise of the Self-Empowerment Pledge says, my faith and my gratitude for all that I have been blessed with will shine through in my attitudes and in my actions. If you live just that one promise, it can be life-changing, can it? And I'll tell you what, if you live in the United States, if you're watching this video now, uh, and you don't live in Haiti or Somalia or Afghanistan, you have an awful lot to be grateful for, an awful lot to be thankful for, don't you? One of the things that uh, I suggest, and a lot of other people have suggested this too, I'm sure you've probably made a shot at it, but make a list of all the things you're grateful for. Some writers recommend every day, get up in the morning and write down 10 things that you're thankful for. I can tell you when I do it, I have a better day. But I'm gonna ask you to raise the bar. Some weekend coming up, sit down with a yellow pad and make a list of 500 things that you're grateful for. And don't stop at 498, go all the way to 500. And it might be things as simple as dental floss, um, when I'm in the Grand Canyon, I'm grateful for things that I take so for granted when I'm in the so-called real world above, you know, things like dental floss or a flashlight or uh, being able to take a stone out of my shoe, seeing a, a shooting star late at night. Make a list of things you're grateful for. You'll be surprised once you hit 500 at what a blessed life you really do live. Now, the converse of gratitude is resentment. And one of the reasons why I am on this kick 
to eradicate toxic emotional negativity as reflected in whining and complaining and playing the martyr, playing the victim, is that I think of it as the anti-prayer, the unprayer. You can be grateful for the blessings of your life or you can be resentful for what you don't have. And that's, what, that's all complaining is. I don't have enough. Uh, the world's not making my life easy enough. Whatever it is, you can't do both. And if you can stop whining, stop complaining, and replace it, you know, the, the pickle pledge says, I will turn every complaint into a blessing or a constructive suggestion. It's the foundation of gratitude. One more thing about gratitude. There is an awful lot of research in the last 10 years or so about happiness and what makes us happy. And it turns out that very high on that list is gratitude. That gratitude is associated with better physical health, better emotional health. It's associated with more success in your career. It's even associated with better financial success. So replace resentment with gratitude. The second cornerstone is forgiveness. You've probably heard this, that, that carrying around a grudge against somebody else is like drinking poison in hopes of hurting that person. Um, the I Ching, the ancient book of Chinese wisdom, says hatred. And that's really all a grudge is, isn't it? It's, it's carrying around hate for somebody else. Uh, that hatred is a chain that binds you to the object of your hatred. And think about that. Carrying a grudge is giving voluntarily giving up your freedom, your freedom of motion. It's like emotional cancer. Kurtz and Ketchum are two AA counselors who wrote a book called The Spirituality of Imperfection. And it's really, it's, there are hundreds of short little stories in this, mostly from recovering, mostly about recovery. Some of them real, some of them fictional. But most of them, one way or another, have to do with letting go of that anger, letting go of that hatred, of achieving a level of forgiveness. And they say there's a continuum. You've got to begin by forgiving yourself. We've all done things we wish we hadn't done. We've all done things that we regret. You've got to forgive yourself and let go. You've got to forgive other people, parents, teachers, schoolyard bullies. Um, and they say you even have to forgive God. And you know, that's something I see in the support groups that I work with. Um, when somebody's lost a child, when, uh, when somebody's been diagnosed with cancer, um, when somebody's been born with a serious uh, problem, sometimes they have to be able to forgive however they define God and be able to move on. It is what it is. Very powerful words, by the way. It is what it is. So I want to give you two practical suggestions for achieving a level of forgiveness. And one is rewrite the past. You know, every historian will tell you the past is simply what you choose to remember and how you choose to remember it. Uh, the American Civil War, as written by a, a Confederate infantryman, will be a very different conflict than the same war as written by a Union cavalryman. The past is what you choose to remember and how you choose to remember it. Think of those memories that cause you pain and anguish and ask yourself, how could I rewrite this to be more positive, nurturing, and affirming? So for example, imagine you were once stuck in the corner by a teacher in school with an orange cone on your head because of the misdeeds you had done. I don't have to imagine that, it actually happened to me. I have a choice, don't I? I can remember that as a humiliating, self-esteem squashing event, or I can remember that as the last gasp attempt of a teacher at the end of his rope on how to get me to stop acting out because he knew if I would stay on the path I was on, I'd end up in even bigger trouble. That is a choice. I can write that history any way I want to. And obviously, writing it the second way is much more self-esteem, self-image enhancing than writing it the first way, the way of the victim. S second strategy I want to share with you is even more powerful. And that is, think of what it is you want to leave behind. What is that emotional baggage you're carrying in the metaphorical backpack of your life that you want to leave behind? What fear is holding you back, stopping you from moving ahead? What anger, what grudge are you carrying around that is ruining your emotional stability and health? And every year when I go into the Grand Canyon, I think of some emotional baggage I want to leave behind. I pick up an ugly rock, stick it in my pack, and let it represent that anger, that fear, that grudge. 
If I'm with a group of people, I ask everybody to do it. And then every day, I take my rock out and I talk to it, literally. I say, here's why I'm going to leave you behind. And the rock will talk back. If you do this in good faith, I don't mean literally, unless you're really dehydrated, but you can actually carry on a conversation. One guy carried on a conversation. The rock represented the fear that was holding him back from quitting the job that was killing his soul and starting a business doing something that he loved to do. And after a week of having this conversation, he realized what that rock represented and he was able to leave it behind. On the last day of our trip, we build a cairn. A cairn is a pile of rocks that marks where a trail goes, another beautiful metaphor. We all lay our rock down, we turn around, we say goodbye to it and walk away. Sometimes, I'm not, if I'm not able to take a, a group into the Grand Canyon, you know, when we do spark plug training, for example, the first day of the three-day course, I'll ask everybody, and I hope by now uh, your, your values trainer maybe has shared this with you already, and you're carrying around a rock, think of what it is you want to leave behind. Carry it around in your back pocket. So every time you sit down, it reminds you of the pain being caused by that emotional baggage. And then we have, and I hope your, your group will have, a ceremony where you actually build a cairn in the front of the room, leave your rocks behind, say goodbye to them, turn around and walk away, and have somebody agree to go dump those rocks in a lake or whatever. And you know, just that creating that visible, tangible metaphor. Why is it so hard to forgive, to leave behind a grudge? Partly because that emotion is invisible. And how do you fight what you can't see? And we have seen people make, and the word miracle is something I hear fairly often from this exercise. Uh, seen people leave behind the priest that raped her when she was a child, leave behind the abusive alcoholic dad, leave behind the person who fired somebody in, in a brutal, ugly way. Uh, because if you can't forgive, if you can't move on and let go of that, it's like you're chained to this hateful event in the past. The third cornerstone springs out of the first two, really. It's love. And I think the Beatles hit it right on the head with their song. All you need is love. There's nothing you can do that can't be done if you have enough love. And they also said the love you take is equal to the love you make. Um, Scott Peck clarified this in his wonderful book, The Road Less Traveled, when he said, love is not a mushy, gushy emotion. Love is hard work. He said, the drunk sitting in the bar crying in his whiskey about how much he loves his family, he said, that's not love. That's narcissism. If he really loved his family, he'd put down the bottle, sober up, join AA, and get a job or two and to help his kids go through college. Love is the ability the willingness to put yourself out on behalf of other people. And so let's talk for a minute about the workplace. Khalil Gibran, in his beautiful book, The Prophet, said, work is love made visible. And if you can't do your work with love, he said, just go sit by the city gates and beg for alms. Don't demean the work by doing it with anything less than love. And what a different world it would be if we all could come to work every day and do our work with love. And for the managers, Jim Autry, another expert on leadership who's written many books on leadership, including servant leadership, he says, more than anything, management is a matter of love. It's a matter of caring. And you might think, like Scott Peck said, I mushy, gushy stuff, soft stuff. But you look at really successful companies, Southwest Airlines being a premier example, companies that take that seriously, they're very successful. Southwest Airlines, they fly out of Love Field in Dallas. Their stock market symbol is LUV, not SWA. And they don't shake hands at Southwest, they give each other hugs. And it's the most successful, most profitable airline in the history of the world. Love can be really good business. One more thing about love. Norman Vincent Peale, the late great writer, speaker, teacher, used to say, how come the second, the second great commandment, he was also a preacher, the second great commandment says, love your neighbor as yourself. How come we always forget the last two words? We forget that loving others has got to begin with loving yourself. My wife says maybe that's why sometimes we treat our neighbors so badly. You've got to be willing to 
embrace who you are to love yourself. You can't pour out of an empty pitcher. And the fourth cornerstone is spirituality. You know, I feel really sorry for people who seem to believe that whoever dies with the most toys wins, that that's what you see is what you get and that that's all there is, and who think miracles don't exist. I think miracles happen all the time. A miracle, however, let me be very clear about it, a miracle is not a magic trick. If I could take a bottle of water and turn it into a bottle of wine, if I did that, you'd know that was a magic trick. But if I could tap a wino on the shoulder and say, stop drinking, be sober, be productive, be happy, every recovering alcoholic I've ever spoken with, almost, and I've spoken with a lot of them, almost all of them eventually use that word miracle. And they'll agree, it's not a magic trick. It is a, a profound inner transformation. It is a, often a long, sometimes a painful process. The late Art Berg wrote a book called Some Miracles Take Time, uh, chronicling his transformation after being made a quadriplegic in a car accident to becoming a world-class wheelchair athlete and professional speaker, the best speaker I, I ever heard in my life. And he says, some miracles just take time. And they don't just take time, they take a lot of hard work. So here are two practical suggestions for creating a higher level of spirituality in your life. One is simply solitude. We live in such a busy, frenetic, over-communicated world. And if it's just a lunch break, you know, walking out in the city park, for me, it's a week in the Grand Canyon, alone or with a few close friends, that helps me connect with something that is deeper than just making a living, doing a job. And the other thing is prayer. And again, I'm really not talking about religion. I think anybody can benefit from prayer. I love the way Tavia in the movie Fiddler on the Roof, he's always talking to God. You know, dear God, why did my horse have to go lame? Um, you know, and I think if you carry on this conversation, uh, you'll begin to hear God talking back or the universe talking back, or maybe it's just your deep conscience talking back to you, but you can carry on this conversation. The late comedian Gilda Radner said, how come if someone's on his or her knees, hands folded talking to God, we call that prayer. But if you're on your knees, hands folded, listening to God talk back to you, we call that schizophrenia. And you know, just getting into that habit of regular daily conversation with something bigger than you, something hopefully wiser than you, prayer can be a, a, a solid source of enhancing your own spirituality. One more thing, and this is a special note for those of you who are in health care. For those of us in healthcare who have an obligation to people caring for people at their most vulnerable, there's an awful lot of research that shows that that patient's faith, their religious beliefs, have a lot to do with their healing, with their recovery, with their health. It is our obligation to honor that patient's faith in every way possible, but to do so that in, in no way do we try to impose our own beliefs upon them. Something that a principal Florence Nightingale held tenaciously. Honor the patient's faith, but do not proselytize while they are in this most vulnerable position. And I think it's something that we have an obligation to take to heart. So we have gone through now core action values one through six, laying a solid foundation of personal character strength, authenticity, integrity, awareness, having the courage to stand up to our fears, the determination to persevere through the challenges, and faith. Those six values lay a solid foundation of personal character strength. And now we make the transition to core action values 7 through 12, which have to do with taking action, getting things done, making a difference in your part of the world. Core action value 7, purpose. Vision, number eight. Focus, number nine. Enthusiasm, service, and leadership. And that's where we go from here. So our journey is not ending. It's making an important transition really from being focused inward to moving 
in the outward direction. I'll see you next time when we talk about core action value number seven, purpose. I'll be there on purpose. I hope you will too.